And that's the kind of ending I want to write is it's inevitable, it's going to happen, but you're going to be surprised at the same time. Hey, Disha. Hey, Donnie. Welcome, everyone, to Ursa Short Fiction, where we geek out on our favorite short stories and writers. I'm Donnie Walton, author of The Final Revival of Opal and Nev. And I'm Disha Filia, author of The Secret Lives of Church Ladies. As always, if you want to support the show, you can share the podcast with your friends or support us directly by becoming an Ursa member at ursastory.com slash join. And today we have got an Ursa plot twist. Love a good twist. We have an author on this show with a novel. Yes, you heard that right. But that's not the whole story. In fact, it's a novel that started out as a collection of short stories. Ruben de Gallardo's debut novel, The Family Isquiero, has received praise, including starred Kirkus and Publishers Weekly Reviews, and is included on the Millions and Kirkus Reviews most anticipated list for the second half of 2022. And our very own Disha Filia called it, quote, a revelation. Ruben de Gallardo's storytelling is as rigorous as it is intricate. Intimate and epic, it brims with magic and spirit. A bold, beautiful debut. A little bit about Ruben. He is also the author of the YA novel Throw, the Texas Institute of Letters 2020 Best Young Adult Book Award, and the Texas Library Association's Choice for Best Books for Teen Readers. His work has appeared or is forthcoming in The Common, Texas Highway, Belliote, Fiction Journal, Gulf Coast, Hayden's Ferry Review, Image, and the recent anthologies Living Beyond Borders and Ne Plant La Familias. Welcome, Ruben! Welcome. Hey, thanks hey. for having me on today. <laughs> well, this is such a, a beautiful mm-hmm. book um, that you have shared with us, and we feel so lucky to have gotten it early. So thank you. I mean, this whole book was just so incredibly emotional. I actually, the last story, the epilogue, the the last bit of the book, I was in tears. Mm -hmm. And one of the favorite thing, one of my favorite things that you do is you access the emotions of men so well, and -hmm. you do it in so many different ways throughout um, this book. Um, With Gonzalo, for example, you know, we get his story via the second person narration and what you bury, what you burn. And in other chapters, we hone in on him through other characters, first person perspectives. And first, I guess I'm just from a craft level. I'm curious about how you go about choosing the POV that feels the most emotional, how you match that point of view to the story that you're trying to tell. Well, first of all, thank you all for having me on here. And thank you for your very kind words. And speaking of emotional, when, you know, when you, Disha, when you wrote what you did about the book, I just, I I broke down and cried a little bit um, because it was just, it was just beautiful to me. And just affirming uh, in the in the work I, I put out there to the world. So, I, you know, for, for, for me, POV is I like to play with POV the most uh, of all the literary devices. I think uh, point of view for me is, is the one I have the most fun with. And I like to really own the POV. I like to inhabit the space and, and in some ways become the narrator and, you know, in a lot of ways. Um, so. For, I'll just take one story, the, the chapter, uh, What You Bury, What You Burn. Yeah. That's the only second person point of view story in the whole book. And the way, the reason I approached it that way is I wanted to approach Gonzalo because you see him as a very flawed guy. There's a lot of traits that he has that are good, but he also has some, some toxic uh, masculine traits. Um, and I wanted to approach it as if he were looking back. Like he's, he's become a better man. He's become a better father, husband. Um, and he's looking back in such a way where he sees himself in this moment in time. And so that's how I approach that one. And, and I guess the others, t- to me, voice and story are, they go hand in hand. So I, I, I always know who the story is going to be told by before I sit down mm. to do it. And I hear the person's voice very clearly in my head. 
Um, and then, of course, when I when I sit down to type, it, it just kind of the, the the person takes a life of their own, and and I go from there. Mm. Lovely. And I want to talk about um, how you came to take those stories. These you know these just really gorgeous complex stories um, with the shifting points of view. And, you know, what was the process of moving from these very, you know, interconnected stories to a novel? So the the first one I ever wrote is the first one that that appears in there, Turroco. And I wrote that story in, I want to say, 90, like 98, 1998. Mm. And when I wrote the story... It's, it's a process of, of exploration, right? So I wrote it and I pretty much I thought, okay, this is the end of this, this little moment in time in this family's life. But the family kept, their stories just kept coming up. So what happened was I wrote that one. Um, I submitted it. It got published in Hayden's Ferry Review. And um, over time, like over the next couple of years, I would write an Esquerdo story probably every, every six months or so. And then that became all I wrote. Mm. at one point. Mm-hmm. And and as I wrote each one, I there was different facets of the family that I would I would write about and then and then different family members would pop up. And pretty soon I, I think I had probably about ten together and I realized, okay, I have a collection here. And so that's how I you know, that's how I submitted it over over time. And and like I said, this is, you know, it's been about twenty years um that I wrote these stories. And so I had a collection, I submitted it, uh, it got rejected several times. And then I, you know, I, I got the first book published, which is actually an Izquierdo novel. Um, it's, it's about Cirilo, he's one of, the, one of the characters in this book, The Family Izquierdo. And so I got that published, and then I got, I got my, my big boy pants on <laughs> at that point. <laughs> like I thought, hey, I can do this, I'm an author now, right? So I uh, got an agent, I, I actually, I, I participated in uh, Twitter pitch events. Mm-hmm. You know, oh. where you, you write a little tweet and, you know, maybe an agent reads it, they like it, and then they, wanna, they want you to send them a letter. Um, so I did that. And then I got like right away after like close to 25 years of, of nothing, you know, I like just getting put, not nothing, I don't want to say nothing, but just mm-hmm. getting published in literary magazines. Um, I got five full requests, like boom, 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 boom. It was, wow. it was like right away, real fast. And then within a couple of months, I got an offer from Tamar. Radzinski, my, my agent. And then in six months, uh, we, you know, we went out on submission and, and it got picked up by Norton. It mm. was, I mean, it was like years and years of waiting. And then all of a sudden, all these things started happening all at once. So it was a really cool, really cool journey. Ah, oh, and I wonder if we can actually back up a little bit. And because I, I would love to hear you, Ruben, talk about this family in your own words and what it was about them that compelled you to keep writing about them for those 25 years. I think in a lot of ways for me, because I'm, I'm a big time reader of uh, Latino literature, Chicano literature, you know, because I want to learn. I, you know, I didn't, I didn't get an MFA. I didn't go to a program or anything like that. So I kind of taught myself um, and I just read a lot. And a lot of the stories I read were about immigrants. And I think those are great stories. I love immigrant stories, uh, but that's not what I wanted to write. I wanted to write about what happens after. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What happens post-immigration? And so the family has arrived and, and what happens in the generations after? So as I explored... The family, and, and you know, some of it is some of it is based on on my family, uh, loosely. But as I explored it, what I started finding was, if I have a big family, which this family is, there's ten, you know, in the in the second generation, there's ten siblings, and then they all have kids. I thought, you know, if I stick with this family, which is very much a, a typical Tejano Mexican American family, if I stick with them, I have I have a big enough canvas where I can write stories for years, which is what I've done. And I don't see myself uh, writing much of anything else because it's such a huge canvas. There's so many stories to tell and there's different generations and there's different family dynamics within the family itself. So I think for me, it was just being able to really get down deep and explore one family and hopefully make it universal enough to where people are thinking about their own. 
Yeah. And you know, something that as you explain that, it's what happens to this family, you know, after they've immigrated, but not through the gaze of you know, what does it mean to be an immigrant? It's what does it mean to be a father? What does it mean to be, you know, dealing with family curses? So mm. the gaze belongs to the family. They are gazing at them, you know, at each other. There's not this sort of outsider gaze. And it's not about how they're contending with outsiders. It's how they're contending with each other and within with themselves. Mm-hmm. And it, that feels also like a very conscious choice. Is that the case? It is. And I think the the thing I, I, I did want to show, if there's anything there with with immigration or, or immigrants in general, is it there is, and I never really state it in the book, but it's there, I think, is that there is uh, kind of this internal jealousy, which, which you know, this, this jealous neighbor, Contreras, Emiliano Contreras, is jealous of the success that they've had. And so, if anything, there's this conflict between immigrants you know so mm. the, the the idea there is that they start off at the same point but they they have different values they have different ways of seeing the world and these ghettos go one direction and this family the Contreras family goes it's a totally different one so yeah for me it was a very conscious choice and 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 I wanted to just tell a universal story that everyone can kind of relate to but but still like I'm writing for everybody but I'm writing to my people if that makes sense Mm, absolutely 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 yeah and 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 we need to just amplify and to you know put a, a underline and bold that 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 is possible you know when publishing talks about whether a story is universal and if there's a, a market for it you know that through our very specific stories you know we can't you know everybody can access stories about our specific cultures that's right Transitioning a little a little bit to what you were just talking about, this curse that Contreras puts on the family. That's one of the um, really interesting through lines in, in the book. It's a curse that affects all the characters. It keeps Dina housebound. It racks Gonzalo with guilt for possibly being the cause of it. And of course, it makes Papa Tavo quite quite ill. Talk about developing this line of tension in the book and and why spirituality and the curses and the curanderas, why all this plays such a large role? Going back to what I've read, I hadn't read it in such a way. And I, and I can't remember the author who said it, um, and maybe all will remember, but, but when, when you want to read something, you write it, and I'm paraphrasing yeah. very badly. But that's, I hadn't seen that. I hadn't seen uh, just a wide array of spirituality represented. Because, you know, you, typically when you read somebody, something from a Mexican-American, it's like heavy Catholicism if re- religion is mentioned at all. And most of the time, you know, a lot of the times anyway, uh, it, it's in a very negative light. But I, that, that wasn't my experience growing up. So in, in my family, I have, uh, you know, you see the Catholics, uh, the Catholicism represented just like you see in the book. You see influences of curanderismo, which is like, like folk healing. But you also see the dark side that we hear about, which is this uh, witchcraft, this brujeria. And there's all this interplay happening. But the, like the other representation I didn't see was we have a lot of like non-denominational Pentecostal, charismatic uh, people that, that you don't really see in fiction. And, you know, you see that through through Victoria and Maggie, the sister and the sister-in-law. So that was another thing that was important to me was just to represent, you know, us and my family and, and the experiences we've grown up. And, and, you know, when I talk to a lot of people that, that have read the book, they're like, oh, my gosh, that's my family. I'd, n- I'd never seen that in fiction before. And I'm like, OK, thank you, because that's... <laughs> That's kind of what I wanted to do is I wanted to show that side of us. Yeah, I think that's a huge motivator for so many writers. And I think that was Toni Morrison who said Mm -hmm. that. Yes. That's why she wrote The Bluetooth Eye. Yes, yes. If there's a book um, that you want to read and it doesn't exist in the world, then you must be the one to write it. You must be the one to write it. Yeah. I want to go back for a second to talk about the men and the emotions of the men. Um, as I said, I cried reading Seferino's story. 
And I loved the tenderness that Gonzalo shows toward Papatavo. And that was such an empathetic exploration of Gonzalo's shame and his regret that it had me feeling so deeply for him when just a chapter before I was furious <laughs> with him. Um, and I was just curious. It, it seemed that there were things that you are saying about or things that you wanted to express about men in these pages. And I wondered if you could talk about that. that I've never been asked that question. <laughs> Thank you. That's awesome. Um, I, I think what I'm trying to say, if I'm, if, if, when you look at the totality of the characters, is that I wanted to do justice to the men in my life, mm -hmm. because yes, there's this, this element of machismo that creeps in, but there's also good masculinity. There, there's there's providers, there's men who who uh, in their own ways are very nurturing and and care for their children, and and you know I think about that one scene with Gonzalo when he takes all the night feedings and he, you know, he, he uh, in a lot of ways, a, a very uh, motherly way, takes care of his son, who's, you know, very difficult, the baby. And, and I think what I was just trying to say was that we're, we're also a tapestry. You know, there, there's so many emotions that I don't think get captured enough or, or talked about uh, because our, our culture, my culture anyway, uh, is, is, you know, we don't talk about our emotions a lot. So I wanted to capture the inner lives of these, of these men who are definitely complex, conflicted, damaged in some ways, uh, but also are capable of, of a lot of good stuff, too. And just to clarify, did you say earlier that your novel, the YA novel Throw, that was about um, Cirillo? Yeah, it's, uh, he's in several of the stories. Mm -hmm. So that's his, his story that takes place before this collection and then... The end of it picks up uh, towards the end of, of, of this book, the second book. And I call it a collection because that's how it started out. Mm -hmm. But it's a novel. And, and, and the way it got woven together was that this character, I'd, I'd written about this character. You know, he's a, he's a tough kid. He's, he's a cholo. He's, he's involved, you know, with, with, uh, with gangs somewhat. He's on the periphery of his life. And so I'd, I'd written about him, and then, and then I said, well, let me continue to write about his family. And he, he even started out as a short story, too. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it, but I found I was I was writing a novel the more and more I wrote about him because that happened side by side. I was really drawn to this character, um, perhaps more than any other in 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 the novel. And I, I'm not exactly sure why. Um, and it may be what you just described. You know, he has this this, you know, toughness. Um, but throughout, there's also this tenor, tenderness and this vulnerability, this sweetness. He's protective of his younger cousins, for example. Um, even when his grandfather buys him a knife, it's a butterfly knife and has a butterfly on it. And I felt like that was, you know, playing with sort of the sharpness and then the tenderness at the same time that's sort of within him. And the net effect was that I just worried about him <laughs> throughout the entire book. I thought <laughs> that there was something you know, catastrophic that was going to, to happen to him. You know, I, I wanted to know if you could speak more about, you know, where this, the genesis for this character, especially now that I know that he has his own book. He does. So the genesis of him was, I was a, I was a teacher here in Texas back in the late nineties. And I had this one student that he rolled with some pretty tough kids. Mm-hmm. But there was this sensitivity to him. He was an artist and, and, and uh, he was really quiet. Um, and when the kids would get rowdy and, and you know, try, try, to, <laughs> try to make me earn my money, <laughs> he, would, he would just sit there and he would draw. And he, and he had such a sensitivity to him and a kindness to him that I thought, wow, that, that, that is a good character for me to think about because everything around him is hard and he has to have a hard exterior, mm -hmm. which he did. Um, you know, he was he was no, no little saint. He got in trouble. But but again, there was a sensitivity to him. And I thought that right there is is representative of a, a lot of us who we are. Mm -hmm. uh, we show something on the exterior, but there's this inner life. And, you know, I never got to know him like I wanted to. But that's why I started exploring him in fiction. And, I, you know, I created this character that does have this this inner life and he's sensitive. But he also knows that he has to. He has to take care of business sometimes, too, you know, and you'll see that if you ever read the first book, you'll see that plenty. But he cares about people. He cares about them deeply and he listens to them. 
and he knows what they need to hear when they need to hear it. So that's kind of what I wanted to express with him. Mm -hmm. I love that. This isn't so much a question, but just kind of a comment as I hear you talk about Cirilo, something that you express so beautifully is this relationship between cousins. Mm. I think that's something as, as, as black people, like that resonated with me very deeply mm -hmm. and having respect and kind of the way that the cut, the younger cousins look at Cirilo is the way that I kind of feel toward um, my older cousins and them feeling protective of me in that some way. There's something even different from the sibling relationship in a way. Sometimes maybe I'm saying that because I'm an only child, <laughs> but I just love the closeness of the cousins in in this book. I love how everyone sort of looks out for little Gonzalo and looks up to Cirilo. And it was just very, very beautiful. So thank you for that. And it's a cool dynamic, isn't it? Like you, you when you, I bet when you see your cousins, mm -hmm. it, it's, you pick up right exactly mm -hmm. where you left off. Like you're 12 oh, years absolutely. old. Again. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. And because, you know, all our parents worked, our grandparents would take care of us during the day in the summer. So we, we grew up together as sort of siblings in these kind of hot months in Florida and playing and just like there were so many formative experiences and um, that closeness, I really felt it kind of permeating through through this book. And there's yeah. and there's one scene and I'm so glad you say that because that that's a, a dynamic that not, I don't I don't know if a lot of people get that your cousins are siblings, but there's something more mm -hmm. to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can relate to your cousins more than you relate to your own brother and sister, right? You find, you find your little affinity group or your age group and, and you're closer to them over time. And I tried yeah. to capture that. There's one scene where I describe a family portrait. And, and so there's this huge family and they're all sitting together. It's the one, one of the family portraits where everybody's there. And to the, the person looking at the photo, the cousins are indistinguishable from siblings. Family units are not, mm. they don't know who belongs to whom. They're just one big family. And that's the kind of thing I, 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 I wanted to say about relate, the relationships that we have with our, with our primos and primas, our cousins. Yeah. And as you said, I mean, this is a huge family and there's so much more that you could explore. You know, I love a book that gives me a chart for mm -hmm. reference. So I saw the one at the beginning of this one and I knew I was in for something that was both epic, but also intimate mm -hmm. because it's a family tree and it's a family mm. story. But I did notice that most of the chapters in the book are sort of focused on the left side of that tree. So I had to ask you, Ruben, is there going to be a part two about that right side? You're, you're like the third person to ask me that. Like, <laughs> so. <laughs> and it, came, it actually came out in the review, too. Like, it, it begs a sequel. I'm like, yeah, for sure. I don't know what to write yeah. about him, but because... <laughs> but I'll find out. I think you have plenty, oh my gosh, plenty yes. of, of ideas and inspiration. And I cannot wait. Yeah, because There's like five other siblings on the right side of that page there that I, you know, they come in and they say a few things, but I haven't fully fleshed them out because I'm, I'm trying to focus on the other five and their kids and, and, and everyone else and the, you know, the grandparents. So yeah, I definitely, I see that in the future. That's something that I've, I've always wanted to do is just, really get in deep and, 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 and explore this family. I am so curious about the baby of the family. <laughs> I'm oh. so curious. Yeah. I dropped a lot of seeds about him. I tried to say, okay, cause, cause there's little things in there, um, for, for Wally, you know, that I mentioned about him, but you never, you don't see a lot of him. So he's probably, if I was going to pick somebody up, he's probably the next project of mine. Cause I have him the most fleshed out of, of the story that I want to tell with this one. Oh, wonderful. You know, you shared the experience of finding your agent. Um, can we talk a little bit about the editorial process for you? Was your book pretty fully formed when you went out on submission? Um, you said it took about six months. And so what was that process like? And, you know, did it meet your expectations or did you know what to expect? I didn't. <laughs> Long story short, like I had no idea what I was in for. Mm -hmm. I really did it. Uh, because I, I put it out there as a collection. And, mm -hmm. and when you put a collection together, 
there's a lot more flexibility in how you order the stories mm -hmm. and and how much they you know they have during conversation with each other so you you can play with that but the more i guess the more edits we did it, ste it started steering more towards being a novel which i hadn't thought of it like that before uh, because when I, I i'm kind of like i don't know what the word is but I, i'm kind of just used to seeing a, a novel be a certain way you mm -hmm. know it's it's got it's it's one narrator maybe two um and then you know i, I read a book like like donnie's and there's like all these different voices mm -hmm. and, and, and and you know yours is yours is different it's not it's not like mine is set up but you definitely everybody has a voice and you see different you see things differently so so yeah it started it started to morph into a novel um and then those vignettes the, there's a vignette between different parts of you see Papa Tavo before. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so those were written actually after the, the, those, those were probably the, the things I wrote later mm. to link and to show that there's connections between the generations. And I always had those in mind somewhat, but for them to, to be placed in such a way that they're connecting the past to the present to form this, this narrative of, of this man of who he was prior to, you know, prior to his decline. So for me, it was, it was, it was a, it was a long process of just re-envisioning what the book was, um, and understanding and, and just re-envisioning what a novel could mm -hmm. be. Right. So that, that process was there. But then the other part was like, I had no idea we would go back and forth so many times because my, my editor, Niniyama Madiobi, she's amazing. She, she pulled things out of me that I didn't think, uh, were there. And just, and she just asked great questions, you know, like, uh, why, why is she doing this? What does she think here? What's going on inside? You know, what's the interiority of this character? Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it just became much fuller and much more fleshed out than, than I had initially thought was possible. It's great editing is such a gift. Yeah. Yes, it is. No, I, I, I am so grateful for, for her and just the work that she did did with me to put this together and, and just, just to re-envision it again. And those pieces that serve as the connective tissue, those italicized portions about Papatavo, was it easy to sort of access that voice since you had all these stories or did it take you some time to get back into the, the sort of background of, of the family again? What I will say was that uh, my own grandfather uh, he passed before I really got to know him, mm -hmm. um, and and there's there's some similarities between Papa Tavo and my and my grandfather on my father's side, so I never got to know him. But what I found was as I was writing these vignettes, in my own way, I connected with him, right? Because mm -hmm. I had heard little stories, you know, that he he would play dominoes and that he would buy ice cream, but I wasn't there for that. I lived up north and. And like I said, he passed away before, or he, he declined rather, uh, before I got to know him well. Um, and so f for me, those vignettes not only connected the, the chapters together so you could see him in his prime and see how loving and caring he was, mm -hmm. but it also connected me with my own grandfather. That's very emotional, Ruben. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure you all have experienced this. It, it was very emotional to write, but it was also cathartic mm. it was very mm -hmm. healing in, in a, a right. lot of ways so i have a more of a, a sense of connection to him now than i had before i actually wrote those pieces and has your family read the book and you know are there family members that can say oh that's like so and so in our family what what is their response been it just came out <laughs> <laughs> so the verdict is still out in some ways, but no, I have talked to a few people, to a few family members uh, who've read it, um, and you know they're going to see they're going to see some things, of course, that that make them think about about our family. But the thing that I, I've heard is that it is like you you, you all started out that it's it's emotional, mm -hmm. it is very emotional, um, and so it, it makes and even people who who are not in my family. Uh, I've heard a lot of folks, you know, in, in, in reviews and just talking to people is that, man, you, you captured my grandfather. Mm -hmm. You captured my aunt. I had an aunt who did that. Uh, you know, my, my cousins used to throw the football with me. They, you know, just comments. It's, it's accessing a lot of things for a lot of different people. Uh, but, you know, as far, as far as my family goes, they're still reading it. It's been positive so far. You know, I have, I have a big family. I have 13 
uncles and aunts wow. on wow. one side, and I have I have seven on another. So I'll, I'll be hearing about it for the next couple of years. <laughs> the next I'm sure. book will be out. <laughs> <laughs> Probably as they, as they read it, but no, they're awesome. They they've been so supportive. I'm, I'm like the, hi, Mijo. He's the author of the family. Look, here he comes. You know, everybody. Aww. They're just very supportive they're of proud. me. And I had family come out. <laughs> yeah, they're proud of me. So it's been it's been beautiful. What is, what's the best sentence you think you've ever written? Oh, wow. So my, the best sentence, and I'll, I'll just read it mm -hmm. if I can. Uh, the best sentence I think uh, in this, in this piece, and then maybe in general, is this. Victoria Gonzalo, little Gonzalo, and Abuelita made that oración over our beloved Papa Tavo. And the words they spoke came out of that barrio in our izquierdo hearts. We're letting go and relief and hope are all the same thing. Mm. Mm -hmm. yes. I'm so I'm so glad that you read that because it segues into my next question, which is about your endings. Your ending sentences have such power. I found myself kind of releasing my breath as I finished each chapter. I wonder if you have a philosophy about how a story should end or how you know that you've reached the end note of, of the chapter or the particular story you're telling. Well, thank you for saying that. I appreciate that coming from you. That means a lot to me. Mm -hmm. How I approach endings is I have the ending in mind before I write the story. I have the image in my head, the lines mm -hmm are not quite there fully fleshed out per se, but I, I know what I want to say at the end. And how I approach, uh, I'm, no, I'm no poet by any stretch of the imagination, but how, how I approach my fiction writing and particularly my endings is I will read them and write them and read them and write them uh, repeatedly until I get how I feel it's best. And so that's, that's kind of how I approach it is, is and the other, the other part of it for me is when I read a story, I, I want to be, I want my breath taken away. And so I'm thinking about uh, Jhumpa Lahiri's uh, A Temporary Matter, I believe the, the name of that oh, one is. Oh, yes. Oh, that story. Oh, and, and, and the very last line in that is, is I, can't, I can't remember exactly, but they, they wept for the things they knew, the things they now knew. Mm. And I was like, oh my gosh, if I can end every story like that and have that kind mm -hmm. of power... Uh, where it just it takes you, but it, it takes you by surprise. But it's inevitable mm -hmm. too. Like it, it, you know that has to happen, but it surprises you still. And that's the kind of ending I want to write. Is it's inevitable. It's going to happen, but you're going to be surprised at the same time. And it's going to feel Fantastic. even if it's unsettling. There's something satisfying. I want to leave the reader with an image. That's the other thing. Is like they, readers are showing up for me as as the author. They're reading my work. I, I want to show up for them and leave them with a powerful image and a powerful thought. You are, when people say a writer is generous, you know, I think this is part of what they mean in that you're thinking about the reader, um, not to cater, but to say, you know, this is, this, you know, you, like as you said, you're showing up for me, I'm gonna show up for you and give you, you know, something really satisfying here. And so that there's a, that's a so kind of generosity um, as opposed to, you know, I'm going to do these, you know, craft tricks on the on the page. <laughs> you know, that's very, very mm -hmm. me centered that you're, you are thinking about us as readers. And, and that's so evident in these stories. I'm curious if you have any writing rituals or what your writing space um, looks like. I have an antique typewriter desk. And it, it's, uh, I, I open it up and I can put a typewriter inside the desk. Um, and sometimes I type, I, I use a typewriter when I'm stuck. Uh, I'll start on a computer, of course, but if I'm having trouble with a section or I, I'm not sure where to go with it, um, I use the typewriter. So I have several typewriters to give me inspiration in my space. But my one ritual, the thing I have to do of course, like a lot of writers, is I need a very good cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I got to have my little tacita de café. I got to have a little cup. But then the other thing I have to do is my desk has to be like spotless. I, so I, 
even if I'm hiding the papers or you know staplers or th other things on my desk, I have to have it very clean, very clear. I cannot start writing until my space is, is how I want it to be. Oh, you would pass out if you saw my desk right now. It is an absolute mess. An absolute mess. Yeah, I couldn't. I couldn't write on your desk. I, you know, no, you could to. not. No. I'm curious. How does the, using the typewriter help get you unstuck? It, it's the physical mechanics of it. You mm -hmm. know, like they say, uh, if you're right, if you have writer's block, and they say go take a walk, think about things, and I and I, and I can do that too. But for me, uh, having this this relationship, this this kinesthetic relationship with punching the keys, using actual paper, seeing the words on the page, it helps me get out of get out of the space of looking at the screen. Because a lot of times the, the screen can be daunting for me. You know, I, I have this big monitor, and it's just all this space that is waiting for me to to write things down. Yeah. But if it's one page at a time, and it's a, like I said, it's it's a, it's a physical piece of paper. And, and it's a typewriter, I feel like, it, and, and it just makes me feel more productive. You know, when you hear that, the, 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 you know, the, yeah. you hear that, or <laughs> no. my typewriter. Yes. When, when you, you hear that, it's like, hey, I'm doing something, you know, I'm like, and, and maybe that's my, my uh, working class background. Maybe that's the, the, the things that have been imparted to me by my father is a very hardworking man, uh, but it just feels mechanical. And it feels like I'm, uh, like I said, like I'm, pro I'm producing something. start writing Ruben and and what precipitated it so I started out in college like seriously writing to where I thought you know I'm gonna work on this craft I mean I wrote really bad poetry in high school that I've, I've told my wife you know I should make her my executor to never <laughs> get these things out if I ever make it <laughs> Uh, really I think we bad. all have pages yes. of those like heartbreak <laughs> poems and all that yeah. mess. Oh, gosh. yeah you're horrible <laughs> So I went to college and I, I started major, I majored in business. And then uh, I had to take the, you know, the basic courses and I was taking English and I had always been a reader, um, but I was taking uh, English. And then one day the professor kept me behind and, and he said, he said to me, well, you know, what's your major? And I said, I said, business, business marketing. And he said, why? And I'm like, well, well, well because that's, you know, I didn't have a good answer. Basically that, that might mm -hmm. make money. He says, you should be mm -hmm. here. You should be an English major. So I went that very day and I, I changed my uh, I changed my major to English. And wow. so um, as I was reading and exploring literature, I started to think, well, you know what? Let me let me try this. And um, and then I, I wrote a short story, which is I'm, I'm not proud of it, but I wrote a I wrote a short story um, and I submitted it to the literary magazine at my college, UTPA, U U University of Texas Pan American. And I submitted it. It was, a, you know, not a great story looking back, but I won second place. Yes. Wow. Second place. And, I, and yes. I, they, gave me, they gave me a crisp $20 All bill. Right. So that was like, <laughs> wow. I felt like I was being yeah. published by the huge magazine. You know, I'm 20, 23 years <laughs> old and I just got paid for, for this thing. And then that's, that's when the bug like really hit me. And I started, I started writing stories. And then a few years later, like I said, I, I wrote the first Isquerdo story because I was writing stuff that was kind of derivative. You know mm -hmm. how we all do. We kind of copy what mm -hmm. we've read or what we think is going to be selling. So I was writing like really bad Chicano Cormac McCarthy and it just wasn't <laughs> working out. Um, and, and then I just started exploring this family and then it clicked. Okay. Oh, this is my thing. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. And I, I, I love that, you know, story for so many reasons, um, in part because I started college as an econ major, but I finished as an econ major because I, I, like you, I was like, I want to do something that's going to make me money. I also don't have an MFA, and I'm, I'm curious about your decision making around that process, you know, in terms of opting not to get an MFA. Well, as I was publishing and I, you know, I was relatively successful. I was getting published in little journals here and there. Um, and I wrote that novel when I, when I was a teacher one summer, I, in the first novel, I, I, I knocked it out the rough mm -hmm. draft. Um, and I, and I got to a point where, and this was while I was living in Oregon. Um, and I got to a point where I said, okay, I'm either this is going to work. Cause I, I had that myth running in my head where if I, if I don't make it by 30, 
I'm a total mm-hmm. failure. You know, you know, mm-hmm. that whole, yeah, <laughs> that, that whole thing. Yeah. And it's, it's crazy that people believe that it's wild, but so what happened was, is I, I, I had wanted an MFA. I'd wanted to go to the program there in Oregon, but then I got into, uh, administration as a school administrator. Mm. And so I became uh, an assistant principal and then I ended up uh, becoming a principal a middle of a middle school. And that kind of I, ha- I had said, you know, I had prayed. I said, OK, if, if I go, if I'm going to be a writer, it's going to happen here. Mm. And, and it didn't happen. So I said, OK, I'm going to focus on my career and I'll do that on the side. I'll work on my educator career. And then, you know, if I if I get published, great. If not, I, I just will, will, you know, do what I can. Um, and then but I kept writing. And then, like I said, at the, at the outset there is I, the more I wrote, I kept writing about this one family and I, the dream came back, you know, the dream came back where I just get, continued to do it. And here we are. Wow. Lucky students too. <laughs> but that's why. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I think maybe when I retire, I think I might go back, you know, maybe be a little, little, little older than the typical <laughs> MFA student. But, you know, I'm, I don't knock them at all because I think it's a really cool process. I did take one creative writing class, but I think uh, it might be something I, I'll go back to at mm-hmm. some point. For our listeners, you know, we love to give sometimes little reading lists. And so I'm curious, Ruben, who you have loved, who's really inspired you um, as a writer over the years any collections you particularly are a fan of or novels? You know, for me, uh, the book that like blew my mind when it came out was mm. Drinking Coffee Elsewhere. Mm-hmm. Ah, <laughs> the favorite on yes. the show. <laughs> Let me tell you, it oh, is so goodness. many people. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, and when I read, you know, I think I read Brownies and in, in uh, it was I think it's Brownies, right? That's the mm-hmm. title of it. Yes. Um, uh-huh. I think I read that in, in an anthology somewhere or a best American short stories. I don't know where I read that story, but then I, as soon as I read it, I'm like, okay, who is this person? Who is this ZZ Packer? Um, and so I, I found the book and, uh, and then I, I, I just fell in love with it. I'm like, wow, the voice is so strong. The way, the way she describes things, the way that uh, just the way she puts her sentences together, the story she's telling um, so that, that book was big for me. And then the other one was, uh, uh, interpreter maladies. Mm-hmm. I mentioned, uh, mm-hmm. Jupa Lahiri yes. at the, at the beginning, she was big. And then more modern stuff is, uh, Sabrina and Karina by Kelly Fajardo Einstein, Einstein. Um, and then another one, which, uh, as I was kind of looking at who to read as, as, uh, semi-connected, uh, short story collections, of course, the uh, Disha's book uh, is amazing. Mm-hmm. Great book. Love that one. Um, And then the other one is uh, The World Does Not Require You. Yeah. Rian Amakar Scott's book. That's another beautiful book. And then like for my valley, to see how to write the valley was uh, Oscar Casares has a story uh, story collection called Brownsville, Brownsville Stories. So those are those are some big ones for me. That's great. What's a short story you wish you had written? Oh, let me see. I'm going to go with a temporary matter. I mentioned that story earlier, but when I re- I read that story, there's so much going on in that story uh, where you have this this inciting event of the you know the power going out for for mm-hmm. a certain period of time, um, and then they start talking to each other and they see each other in the darkness like they've never seen each other before, and just that that last page I read that and I'm like if I can write a last page like that that would just make my world so I think. I think uh, if I had any story that I could think of just at the top of my head, that's the first one that comes to mind just because the structure of it, I love the structure of it, but I also love her ending. And as we've talked about before, I, to me, the ending is the best part. Yes. I teach that one a lot. And no matter who I'm teaching it to, it always resonates for people. And it always has that gut punch at the end. Um, it is a very beautiful story. It is beautiful. And the way that uh, Jhumpa Lahiri, she has such, she writes with such power, but also with restraint. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then the and the effect at the end is all the more powerful for the restraint that she's had and sort yeah. of withholding certain information until the exact right time. So I do teach that one a lot for dissemination of information, how to like how and when to 
get information across to the reader so that it has the most impact. And it's yeah. inevitable. That's the point. Like, yes, it, it, it has to come at the exactly where it does. And, and in my book, Family Unit, y'all mentioned Family Unit. That's my temporary matter. I was kind of writing that in, in homage to that story. Yes. Lovely. No wonder I was crying. <laughs> um, for, for your novel as a whole, what do you wish you could go back and say to pre-publication you about the process? I, I would probably say to be patient. Your time will come because like I said, I, I gave up. In, in, some, in some sense, I wrote stories, but I was writing for the sake of writing and I, I had no hopes of making it big or, or, you know, writing a book. I was just wanting to tell these stories. And I think what I would tell that person is, you know, keep doing what you're doing. It'll happen someday, but keep the focus on, on writing the words down. So just be patient. Your time will come. And mm -hmm. here I am 50 years old and, and, and I'm a debut yes. author, the debut literary yes. author. Hey, listen, we're, we're all yes, late we bloomers are. here. Join so club. <laughs> we are all three of us. Yes. Yes. We, we need to start our own. I've always said we need to start our own uh, award. They have the, <laughs> what is it? The, uh, how many under 35 or whatever? Uh, yeah. like, we need like five, five, yeah. five over 50 yes. or something like that. We need our own. <laughs> I love that. I am so curious in a book this full of lively, wonderful, richly drawn characters. Do you have a personal favorite? I could mention Sidi Lowe. Mm -hmm. We talked about mm -hmm. him, but I would I would say Victoria is probably my favorite character. Yeah. Yeah. Because she's so strong. Um, the the word I use is chingona, which means like. To, it doesn't really have a translation, but it means like badass, like a really tough person. And so I, I would say Victoria, and for a lot of reasons, she's she's an outsider in a lot of ways because uh, she sees things differently. She has a different faith. She's not izquierdo by blood. She's izquierdo by, by marriage. Mm -hmm. uh, but she sees the world as as it is in a lot of ways. I mean, er, you know, she has her own perception of the world for sure. But she sees things that are happening and she sees them. She sees what's really going on. Um, and she just has this this power about her that she's kind of this uh, representation of all the powerful Chicanas, all the powerful uh, Mexican-American women in my life, um, because she she doesn't you know, she tells them like with Gonzalo, she just tells them right away, hey, you're on probation, you know, basically any more of that stuff. And I'm out of here. And she shows, you know, she's a nurse. She's got her own career. Uh, but at the same time, this family has become her family and she's willing to fight for them, you know, fiercely. So I would say mm -hmm. probably Victoria. And I mean, just think of the name uh, Victorious mm -hmm. um, because she is she ends up being this this uh, victor of, of everything at the end of it. I was you know, she had me at the end of the first story or actually I think it may be the second story where she prays the opposite <laughs> of what she's being asked to pray for. You know, where mm -hmm. um, it's mm -hmm. coming versus going. I can't, I, I'm trying to do it yeah. for recall right now. But yeah. I thought that, that there was that sort of boldness, but also, again, in a very quiet way, it's through a prayer. But she is, you know, she has her own ways of resisting. And you see her arc, you know, she, she grew, I try to create an arc for her where she grows in strength, you know, throughout the book until you see where she ends up at the, at the end of it. Mm -hmm. And, and just, just, where she comes from too. She's, she's in this place where she's, she has her own trauma that she's, she's dealing with that you don't really see uh, until it's the right time for you to see it. And you kind of understand more of why she is the way mm -hmm. she is. Now I have to look it up because it was so good. <laughs> and the, <laughs> it, the chapter is, is it Turoko? Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. That's the first one where she says coming, not leaving, coming, not leaving in her sad sing song way. Right, right, right. Oh, and that's, it's not that she's invoking. She's saying, you know, that the, they're talking about the spirits leaving the family. And she's like, nope, they're coming. <laughs> uh -huh. They're, they're coming. coming. Like I say, yeah, she's, she's got this spiritual knowledge to, to see deeper to what's actually going mm -hmm. on. 
I also, I loved Victoria. I also loved Maggie. Mm -hmm. I loved Maggie's voice. I just sank right into it. And there was sort of a playfulness and a humor to her that I really enjoyed. And it felt really distinct from other things and other voices in, in the book. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that. And, and Maggie, like of all the narrators I've ever written, Maggie's voice was the one I heard the clearest. Mm. Wow. Uh, just the way she says things like uh, I go instead of saying mm -hmm. I say or I said mm -hmm. I go. Yeah. Uh -huh. goes, um, and she just has she has her little quirks and her, her little ways of talking. So, yeah, she's definitely I've heard, I've, I've heard from people they want to hear more Maggie because she's always hinting at her carousing past. <laughs> you know, th things that she's done before. They always want to know, OK, well, what was that? What did that involve? Yes. So, yeah, she's another favorite of, of folks. But I, I yeah, I, I love them all. It's hard. It's like saying which family member you love the most, and it's yeah. hard for me. But, but definitely, I would say Victoria, but and, and Maggie's a, a close second for mm -hmm. sure. I love that you said mm -hmm. earlier, writing for you is about dis discovery and exploring, and you know you can, you, you won't know if, where that line is until you write something, you know, rather than you know just sort of being afraid to try, you know, that you're mm -hmm. willing to not know how it's going to pan out, not know where that line is, but to write, to write anyway. And I'm imagining you now fearlessly at your typewriter on your immaculate desk taking those risks yes. every day. Like a superhero. Balancing act. <laughs> I know. <laughs> That's it, is. Fun, right? it is. It's really a heroic kind of effort to show it up is. on the page, to not, you know, be beholden to a plan, but truly you were talking about, you know, the characters coming to you. I think it was our friend uh, Maurice Carlos Ruffin that said when we were talking with him, it's almost like having a seance, and, but, you know, it requires an openness um, and, and I think a whole lot of trust to, to, to have the story come to you in that way. Yeah. And again, I have to go back to the reader and, and thinking, and, and I'm not trying to please the reader, but I want the, I want the reader to be satisfied for lack of a better word. Like by the end of the story, they, they, they realize I have experienced something and that that's kind of what I, I want them to experience something to walk away. And each reader is going to get something different, right? But I want them to walk away uh, having had that experience with me. Thank you. I think that's a beautiful yes. end note. Thank you again, Ruben, for being here today. This was such a joy and the highlight of my Absolutely. day. Thank you. Oh, it was for me, too. No, I've been honored. Thank you all so much for this show and for having me on here. I love it. I listen to it on my way to work, and I enjoy it. And I'm just glad to be a part of it. Aw, thank you. And thanks everyone for joining us. If you too like what we're doing at URSA, be sure to share this podcast with your friends. And if you'd like to support us directly, become an URSA member by going to ursastory.com slash join. You'll help fund production of this show and keep us going. We'll see you next time. <laughs>